Great. Welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming back, even after the fire alarm. <laughs> um, so we are uh, very excited today to have Dr. Laura Brindley visiting us uh, from the University of California, Los Angeles. Um, and, uh, of course, we're here um, for the Francis Institute for Children and Families, honoring the legacy of Francis Palmer, who was a business leader and philanthropist, um, who really focused and advocated for the rights of children and families. And we're also here uh, because of uh, the general skeptic of Pamela Tuberville uh, for this year's series. Uh, she is an alumnus, alumni of the uh, Family Consumer Sciences and Education uh, here at the University of Arizona. And today we're here to hear uh, the work of my colleague um, and longtime colleague and friends um, from uh, UCLA uh, and Dr. Ray Lake. Uh, has a PhD in Human Development Family Studies from Penn State University, and her work uh, focuses on civic youth engagement, how that changes across development, um, and has provided us with some really nuanced information that has been important for understanding civic engagement among young people and, and how it develops across time and the importance of their voice, which is, of course, very relevant and timely um, for right now. And so, thanks for joining with me for this. inviting me because this has been a great visit already. I, I got here on Sunday and I had a great day yesterday, topped off with the community conversation with Girl Scouts of Southern Arizona, which was really meaningful for me and just so inspiring to see and hear from all of the young people there who were already engaged in such great work and hear from adults in the community. Um, it seems like a very vibrant Tucson community that's supporting young people already, so that was really great for me to be a part of. Uh, so today, I'm going to talk to you about uh, <coughs> civic empowerment in urban community context, and just to kind of give you a little bit of an overview of what to expect, I'm going to start off with some background of what civic engagement means and what it means to me in my work. Um, and then a little bit of background of prior literature <coughs> that's looked at um, civic engagement in uh, low-income urban communities uh, among youth of color. Um, so what the existing literature looks like. And then I'll spend the majority of the time talking with you about a relatively new study that I've been doing called the Youth Voice Project. Um, this is a qualitative study of 90 young people in um, urban Rochester, New York. Um, and most of my research, um, so if you read any of my research, most of it is very quantitative and longitudinal. So this is a fairly new type of project for me, but I'm really enjoying it and uh, really appreciating the value of hearing youth's voices directly. Uh, this is going to be the first time I've shared a lot of the findings um, all together so you guys are my first time audience but I really wanted to use this opportunity to share some of the new things that I'm finding and get some feedback um, from you so I'm really eager to hear um, your reactions and questions and, and feedback on some of the work. So I'll start with what is civic engagement. You all know what civic engagement means to you and what it, what it looks like in the context that you're in. Uh, my scientific definition really comes from multiple disciplines, um, psychology, uh, political science, and sociology. So um, I define civic engagement as behaviors, values, and attitudes knowledge and skills, so it's a lot of it's multi-dimensional, that result from interactions between individuals and their context and constitute pro-social and political contributions to community or society. So obviously that's a mouthful, uh, but I'm going to break it down a little bit into what I see as the key components of that. So in other words, civic engagement is a multi-dimensional construct. 
most people think of it as behaviors or actions, which that is a big part, and that's one thing that we um, look at a lot in research. But it's not just behaviors. Typically, political science looks at voting. Um, developmental science has historically looked more at volunteering. Um, but when, especially when you think about youth civic engagement, I believe it's important to be really inclusive of many different ways that young people choose to, to engage. And the psychological <coughs> dimensions, like attitudes, values, <coughs> knowledge, those are as important to study as behaviors in, from my perspective because not all young people have the same opportunities to engage. Um, so we need to think a little more broadly than behavior when we think about civic engagement. Um, I believe that civic engagement is fundamentally rooted in person context exchanges. Um, so civic engagement is a social construct and it requires some type of interaction with um, society to form these understandings and actions around social or community issues. And that um, really reflects my theoretical perspective um, from developmental science in um, my work is mostly rooted in relational developmental systems thinking. Um, and then finally, um, civic engagement is both political and non-political. Uh, and this is really reflecting the interdisciplinary nature of this definition. So political science mostly sees engagement as political only. And it, it excludes a lot of community-based forms of engagement, whereas um, psychology and especially developmental science, uh, particularly the positive youth development perspective, has typically looked at community-based forms of engagement and helping behavior, but tends to exclude the political. So there's really a, um, a division in the literature. There's silos. Um, and I believe it's important to study both of them together. Okay, so why youth civic engagement matters. Um, you're probably here because you already think it matters. Uh, and especially the, con at the conversation last night, we had a really rich uh, discussion of all the different ways that youth civic engagement matters. Uh, but I just wanted to share a little bit of what motivates me um, to study youth civic engagement. One reason is because we know that youth civic engagement is really important for promoting optimal development and there's an accumulating body of research that youth civic engagement is linked to um, better physical health, um, psychological well-being, and also um, building skills and social and emotional competencies like empathy, perspective taking, um, as well as things like leadership and appreciation for diversity. So there's a lot of potential developmental uh, benefits uh, for young people to participate in civic engagement that I think it's important to recognize. Also, civic engagement um, has tangible impacts on communities of solving community problems, building community infrastructure, um, social resources like social capital. So engaging young people in civic engagement is actually a community building exercise um, that's important for, for our communities. And then finally, really to understand social change, you have to understand <coughs> civic engagement and particularly civic engagement of young people. So when you look at young people's values, attitudes, and behaviors uh, of young people today, that's telling us where our society is going in the future because young people are the leaders of our future society. And as we have seen recently with the marches and activism around gun violence, young people are today's leaders as well. So really understanding uh, what matters to young people and how they're engaging helps give us a vision for what social change um, looks like in our society. So anyway, those are the, the kinds of things that motivate me to study youth civic engagement. So um, when we think about 
developmental research on civic engagement, one of the prevailing, prevailing theoretical models is the positive youth development perspective. Um, this might be hard to see um, as it's like a, an image from another paper, but this comes from Rich Lerner and colleagues um, where the model lays out first an interaction between um, the strengths adolescents bring um, and the ecological assets in their environments. And there is a, a reciprocal interaction between those that leads to positive youth development defined here as the five C's, confidence, char uh, confidence, character, connection, and caring. So that's a lot of C's. <laughs> um, and, and building those competencies, et cetera, results in positive and active civic engagement, as well as in this model, reduced risk or problem behaviors. Um, so this is, a, this is the prevailing theoretical model. And empirical evidence on this model largely comes from middle class white youth. So we have had quite a few studies that support this pathway towards civic engagement, but there hasn't been a lot of research that, um, that thinks about whether the constructs have the same meaning across different um, different communities and different groups of young people, whether the pathways are the same or different um, for different groups of young people. So, um, so these kinds of questions is partly what motivated um, my study that I'm going to tell you about today. Um, <clears throat> before I get to that, though, I want to talk a little bit about what do, what do we know about youth civic engagement in urban community context, and when I'm talking about urban community context, that, that can be a very diverse um, diverse thing to talk about because there are a lot of different communities within an urban area, uh, but I'm mostly, the community I worked with was a low-income urban community with mostly um, individuals and families of color. So that's, that's the framing I'm taking when I use the short in the urban community. Um, so, research had, over many decades, has shown that there are socioeconomic disparities in youth civic, in, in youth civic engagement and adult civic engagement of many different types. So we've known this from political science over many years, um, and there has been really good research on youth in particular, such as um, Atkins and Hart who really looked at what are the, um, what are some of the lacking resources in um, low-income urban communities that lead to lower civic engagement, such as um, less educated adults, um, less interactions that you have with adults in these environments, and more stressors that come from living in high poverty contexts. So we know that there's a lot of disparity in civic engagement, but on the other hand, there's some really great work, and I think it's a growing body of work, that really highlights uh, civic exemplars in, in these urban contexts with youth of color. So uh, what I mean by civic exemplars is young people who are, who are activists and who are making big changes in their communities or, or being community leaders in, um, in contexts where it may not have been um, expected. So that's really inspiring research. Some of it is participatory um, action research. Uh, a lot of it is qualitative. Um, and in addition to that, there is some other um, good work that really focuses on interventions in these low-income urban communities. Uh, that focus on building civic competencies and empowerment. Um, notably, in that line of work is Rod, some of Rod Watts' work on uh, building critical consciousness and developing critical consciousness among um, young black men in urban communities. <clears throat> 
but um, what I see as the gaps or the main gaps in this research that I wanted to try to address with my study. Um, first is that we have uh, research on two extremes. We have research that really focuses on disengagement in these urban communities and um, some of the socioeconomic reasons for disengagement. And then on the other <laughs> hand, we have civic exemplar research that really highlights some great civic action and work that young people are doing despite the barriers. Um, what's needed, I think, is more research that captures the naturally occurring variability within a sample of urban youth um, to see well, what are the factors that lead to disengagement and what are the factors that lead to engagement and are those pathways true for the same individuals at different times. So can we understand what's going on better with, with the um, sample that has more variability? Um, and then the second piece is that really there needs to be more theoretical work um, to understand are the pathways that we are expecting from positive youth development um, theory um, are those really the right pathways, or are they are there unique pathways of, um, for certain young people? Okay, um, and then a little bit more background. I'm getting to the study very soon, um, but you may have noticed in the title of my talk, uh, I I mentioned civic empowerment, and when we started analyzing the qualitative data we realized, we were trying to understand civic engagement. We realized that empowerment was a concept that mapped on well to how youth talked about um, making a difference in their communities. And so we ended up um, integrating this concept into our, um, into our research and into our framework. So I just wanted to tell you a little bit about that. Um, that'll lead into some of the findings. Empowerment is a um, very diverse concept with a lot of different meanings in different disciplines. Um, psychological empowerment really is has roots in community psychology, liberation psychology, and also um, social work, where I find myself um, now. Um, and I um, wanted to read to you um, a very common definition of civic empowerment by Zimmerman and Rappaport, um, where they define empowerment as a combination of self-acceptance and self-confidence, social and political understanding, and the ability to play an assertive role in controlling resources and decisions in one's community. So what I like about the empowerment construct is that it is inherently a civic construct in the way that many people talk about it. It's about um, it's about having these psychological resources that you can um, mobilize to create some change in um, in the community. And there are um, there is more than one dimension of empowerment. Um, there's a lot of work on this. There's some great work by Stephen Russell um, looking at what empowerment looks like in youth activists and gay straight alliances. That was informative for some of this work. Um, the conceptual model that um, our data really naturally aligned with is a model by Brian Christians who studies, um, who's a community psychologist and studies empowerment. Um, and he talks about four different dimensions of empowerment. Um, and I know that you can't necessarily read this, but I'll just tell you um, sort of what each are defined as. And these map on to the ways that we saw empowerment coming out with our qualitative data. So there's emotional empowerment, which really is the, um, the efficacy um, and desire um, to make a difference. So it's this motivational, um, component um, to, to make create community change. Uh, there's a cognitive component, which is 
uh, includes uh, critical awareness, which is a concept that, that aligns with the critical consciousness literature on youth, um, as well as how to mobilize resources to create change, so sort of knowledge of how change happens. Um, relational empowerment is a concept that aligns well with collective efficacy, um, so the idea that you need uh, relational resources in order to create community change. Um, and then finally, um, Ian has a behavioral component, which really is synonymous with the way that I talk about civic action. So it's really the action piece. Okay. Um, so now we're getting to the good part of the study. So um, the, there are two main research questions that guided this study. There are some others, but these are the two that I'm going to focus on today. Um, how do urban youth of color define and experience community engagement? And then um, what assets and barriers to civic empowerment do youth identify? Uh, and you'll notice um, a small switch in my language here from civic engagement to community engagement, um, which is a little bit intentional because when we asked youth about um, what does community mean to you, what does community engagement mean to you, we use the term community instead of civic because we, we didn't want to have to define terms for them. We wanted to know what their definitions were. And civic engagement is just not a lay term, really, um, in the same way that community engagement is. So we decided to use that language in talking with young people about it. Um, so we can talk about that if you'd like. Can I ask a quick clarification? Of course. So you kept civic with the second question. Did you? Civic empowerment, that's really sort of, um, we didn't ask them directly about empowerment, okay. so we didn't use that language in um, in the interviews, but that's sort of like how we mapped what they said about their engagement, that this empowerment construct seemed to come up. But with community <coughs> engagement, I think that there might be some differences if we had asked them about civic engagement possibly, but we just chose, yeah, so I just wanted to use the language that reflected uh, what we asked. That was a good question. So um, this is like a little bit of an advertisement portion of the talk where I wanted to acknowledge uh, the funding uh, for this study, which is really funding for the analysis and dissemination part. Um, the data were collected with an internal grant from my university, but um, the Corporation for National Community Service is a federal agency that mostly funds um, and administers the program uh, aspects of AmeriCorps and also Senior Corps, but they do a little bit of research funding. Um, and my program officer is Roshni Menon, who is a graduate of this program. So she wanted me to just say hello. <laughs> um, and she also wanted me to um, let you know about the research funding that they, um, they give dissertation awards on an annual basis for research like in this broad area. So for graduate students, this is something to look out for. Uh, and they have a current call for um, participatory action research projects. So for those of you who do that, um, could be useful. So, um, so that's a note from our sponsors. <laughs> uh, okay, so I want to tell you um, about some of the settings that the study is situated in, starting with Rochester, New York. Um, I don't know if many of you know much about Rochester, New York. It's a mid-sized city. Uh, it has about 200,000 people. Um, it has a high proportion of black or African American individuals, and they're mostly, um, they mostly live in the center city. Um, and there are, um, there's a large proportion of white individuals that live out in the suburbs. So there's a lot of segregation uh, in the city. The high school graduation rate is 51%. Let that sink in for a second. A little over half only of young people are graduating from high school in this city. 
um, which is a huge social problem that the city is trying to tackle. So there have been a lot of initiatives around that. Um, this number jumped 4% from last year, so there is kind of some slow progress being made, but it's a, it's a, big, um, it's a big thing to consider uh, when thinking about young people and how they're experiencing life in the city. Um, there is a high um, poverty rate and crime rate that's concentrated in the center city. So, um, so this uh, this is a mapping of the crime rate in the city of Rochester, where the white is a higher crime rate. Um, let me see. I have some, sorry, I'm not keeping up with my notes here. Um, the violent crime rate is double the national average, and the general crime rate. Um, per square mile is 263. So 263 crimes per square mile in the city um, compared to the national median of 32. Um, so there's a very high crime rate. Um, there is a lot of gang violence in the city, um, which you'll hear about somewhat um, in the findings. And this is the poverty rate, which as you can see, aligns well with, um, with the other map. Um, the dark red area um, in the very center reflects uh, 59 to 73 percent of people who are living below the poverty rate in, um, in the center of the city. Um, so the center of the city is where, um, where our study took place. Um, but I wanted to tell you a little bit about um, the historical context that uh, frames the study in a broad way. Um, in the summer of 2015 is when we started the study. And um, these are just some of the national events uh, related to um, police and police interactions with black individuals that resulted usually in the killing of, of the unarmed black male, um, mostly, and, and there are many other of these events that happened in the years prior, but these were some of the most salient events that were happening right in the spring and summer of 2015 um, that really are a framing for the study, so um, it partly motivated me to want to ask young people how they're thinking about these events and how they're experiencing any like that. So that was a part of the interview that, um, that I'm not focusing on right now. Uh, but you'll, you'll hear some hints of it a little bit in the findings. Um, but it's just important to sort of think about the historical setting that they're, that they're in. So um, this sample description, um, there were 90 young people recruited from five recreation centers in the center city. Um, the recreation centers are funded by the city, um, and there's spaces for young people to come in and out as they please. There is a little bit of formal programming that sort of, it depends on the center, but typically it's, in, it's very informal. So there's staff there, there's sports and, and other types of recreation that youth can engage in. Uh, so we partnered with um, with the staff. Um, they were really excited about the study, and they did a lot of the recruitment for the study. Um, there were mostly high school students. Um, a few were in eighth grade. Um, when we asked about income on a five-point scale, um, the average was slightly above two. This is Young People's Report, which is around just enough money for the things that we need. Um, and then um, the grade report was, a, was around mostly B's and C's, but there was a pretty good range of academic performance um, by Young People's Report. There were a few more males than females in the study, um, and we did have a binary measure of gender. Um, and then um, youth were mostly black, uh, which reflects the demographics of the, of the city center, um, although there were a few other ethnic minorities uh, represented as well. Okay, so um, my qualitative analytic approach um, after transcribing first was to um, 
we used an inductive approach that was multi-stage. Um, so it happened over many iterations of looking at the data, creating, um, coming up with the main categories and building consensus around that among the research team. After we had the code book, which took about um, six to eight months to create, we have a very extensive list of codes and themes. Um, then we engaged in a focused coding process where we coded each interview um, aligning with this coding system and we adjusted the coding system as needed as we went along. Um, and then we started analyzing, while we were doing the coding, we started analyzing the data with our reflections um, through memo writing. Um, and then we've been doing more um, synthesis across um, coding categories and themes through memo writing. So um, we do have more analyses to go. That's one, of, one thing I was saying earlier is that I feel like qualitative analyses in some ways could go on forever. Um, but we want to analyze individual cases to see how they uh, support or disconfirm the conceptual model that we're building and that I'll, I'll share with you. So, um, starting with the first research question, um, <coughs> how does Urban Youth of Color define an experience community engagement? Um, we have, um, there were many different types of engagement that young people talked about, and we put them into, hopefully you can see that the colors are kind of bright there, um, but we put them into uh, common categories that included helping neighbors informally, keeping the streets clean, um, being a mentor to others, either helping peers who were struggling or helping younger kids, um, helping the less fortunate, which tended to be helping homeless people um, in their communities, um, school clubs, um, community organizations, which typically included churches, but also there were other, other community organizations listed um, leisure activities, which is not typically something we think of in the civic engagement realm, but has to do with um, block parties and other social activities that bring the community together. Um, and a few at the bottom that were somewhat unique included um, intervening with peers. Young people talked about convincing their peers not to join a gang or not to sell drugs or not to do drugs and this was um, this was had meaning as part of their community engagement for them ways that they were trying to change their um, their communities and help other people around them and another um, piece that you don't typically see is intervening in community violence uh, so there were different ways that young people did this but um, it tended to be pretty high risk context where they would step in to try to stop a gang fight or a knife fight um, or large or small fights that were happening among their peers. Uh, it tended to be um, young men who were more likely to talk about doing that. Um, and then um, speaking out about community problems, um, what included some political actions. Young people don't talk about it really in political terms. Uh, but included things like protests, um, also things like poetry slams um, and activities like that, as well as more informal ways of speaking out about things that matter to them. So just some um, takeaways in thinking about what community engagement means to this group of young people. Uh, it tended to be pretty informal, um, which is important because in most civic engagement quantitative studies, we measure a lot of formal ways of engagement and we tend to exclude um, or downplay these informal forms. So I think that that's really important in, in interpreting what, what are disparities in, in youth civic engagement. Maybe we're not measuring the right things. Um, and also very local. So young people tended to think about their engagement in very local ways. Um, and this, both of these things really do have implications for how we conceptualize and measure civic engagement that really we should be thinking about contextually dependent ways of doing that. 
So moving on to empowerment, um, emotional empowerment, as I sort of mentioned, it aligned well with Christian's model, which had to do with speaking up, having a voice, having a strong desire to make a difference, having some confidence in your ability to do that, uh, and some hopefulness that change would happen as a result of one's efforts. Um, just um, one example of this uh, came from this youth who said, I feel like I just have to know what I'm, I have to let others know what I'm facing, um, and if I don't, then it'll just keep harming me inside. So she was communicating this idea that I just have to speak up. Um, she said, a closed mouth, don't get fed, basically. So you, nobody's going to know what youth problems are um, unless they speak up and, and share them. So relational empowerment uh, was really talking about the way that community change happens is through people coming together. So there has to be a collective effort. Um, there needs to be trust and relationships. Young people talked about that as a requirement for this type of community change. Um, they talked about collective voices in general and also that young people's voices needed to be heard and brought together in particular. Um, and they also envisioned um, collective forms of action. So um, hopefully you can see this, this looks rather small, but, um, but here's one example of um, a young person who was talking about um, how community change happens and she was saying, well, you, um, my family knows a lot of people and so they can start talking to people and they can start talking to people and, um, and then it would just become a huge snowball of power. And I just really loved that. She was talking about a power to create change really accumulates when more and more people come together. Um, and then I wanted to show you a second one here of a youth who uh, said, people don't listen to just one person. A few people telling them and, and they're going to start thinking about it. But if just one person tells them, uh, they're not going to think about it. It might cross their mind a couple of times, but it's not going to make a huge impact. That's why you got to have to protest. And so it was like, okay, what do you mean by protest? Uh, and then he goes on to say that he was thinking of a nonviolent form of protest as a way um, to create change. So this is really an example of both, like you need a lot of collective voices, and he's starting to envision what collective action looks like when those voices come together. Uh, so finally, uh, cognitive empowerment had two components um, that were both a part of this other theoretical model, but we think that they're very separate. Uh, one was an articulation of structural issues. So what are the root causes of some of the problems that, that they're seeing? <coughs> In their communities, um, they talked about a lack of education, the high school dropout rate, which is really salient to them uh, because they know a lot of people who have dropped out of high school. The role of government um, in creating and sustaining policies that have implications for them, such as gun-related policies and also welfare policies. Um, so they talked about poverty. The urban-suburban divide, which is uh, both socioeconomic and racial in Rochester, uh, and other uh, other conversations about race, power, and oppression that they talked about. Um, and then the other component of, of cognitive empowerment was really having knowledge of the steps that it would take to create change. So exactly how does community change happen? What are some of the community resources that they can identify? And then what could they articulate <coughs> specific plans for how to go about creating change? Um, so I'm going to show you an example of um, the understanding of structural issues. Um, this young person was talking about community violence and then starting <coughs> to come back to poverty. Um, so he was talking about this um, knife fight that happened um, 
that he saw, and then he's saying it, it leads to poverty because um, this young person um, couldn't afford a pair of shoes. He calls them thick, he calls them joggers. Um, and so he's saying um, that led to this fighting because his shoes got stolen. And so he was fighting back because of this. Um, and so the young person goes on to say that there's a cycle of poverty um, because, um, because the poverty leads to this violence. Um, and then he says even when it comes down to food, people will fight over it because um, there's just a lack of resources in the <coughs> Um, so here, these are some tentative, um, tentative conclusions that I'm working on, but I really see a link between empowerment and civic action, that empowerment leads to action, but there are specific types of actions that seem tied to these different ways that young people experience empowerment. So we need to do some more analysis on this, but so far, <coughs> emotional empowerment, seems related to um, things that young people feel like they can do on their own. Um, helping their peers was one of the big things, and being a role model to younger children uh, seem to be come out of feeling emotionally empowered. Relational empowerment um, did seem to relate more to collective forms of engagement, um, which included some protesting, uh, cleaning up the streets, which was a, a pretty common theme actually among the young people, um, and then avoiding fighting or engaging in fighting to protect each other. Um, and then cognitive empowerment, um, the, um, the planful part seemed to be related to young people taking leadership roles. Um, the structural analysis actually doesn't seem to be related to civic action. Um, and this was because for a lot of young people who could really understand the depth of the problem of poverty and racism, they tended to um, be disempowered, actually. Um, so that's something that we want to understand a little bit more, but, but it's a tentative conclusion. Um, related to disempowerment, I wanted to talk about that a little bit because that's a pretty prominent theme as well. Um, defined according to young people's perspectives as both feeling personally unable to make a change in the community or articulating a broader inability for anybody to solve the problem, that the problem might just be too big or, or impossible to solve. Um, and this is one young person who, um, taught, who was disempowered according to our, our codes. Um, and I put two codes here so you could see how disempowerment tended to thread throughout the interview for young people who, um, who expressed this. Uh, so when he was talking about community violence, he said um, it really depends. Um, on how you approach it, but the way that Rochester is set up, nobody is going to listen to the kids. Um, so that was something he felt like young people weren't going to be listened to. Uh, and he talk, went on to talk about how everybody just cares about themselves. Um, people are trying to kill you. Um, they'll be your best friend. And then the next 30 minutes, they're not. So he really had also this expression of mistrust or feeling that there's a lack of trust in the community. Um, and then on police shootings, these are the national police shootings that I was mentioning, um, he said, I feel like you just can't do nothing now because they're dead. Um, and they're just dead. Um, and you know, the police, they still have their jobs. There's nothing you could do. Everybody wished that thing, wishes that things could have gone differently. Um, but there's nothing you can do now, so you just have to move on. So this is an example of, of disempowerment. So I want to move on to, I do want to leave some time for questions, so I might skip over some of these examples, but I want to move on to the second research question, which was, what are the assets and barriers to civic empowerment that you've identified? Um, so um, starting with some interpersonal assets, um, there were a 
wide range of positive community connections that young people identified as really important for their engagement or their um, feeling like they can make a difference. Um, some of these are already reflected in the positive youth development literature and align well with what we already know um, that other young people talk about. Um, there's familiarity and comfort um, with the settings and with people in those in the community settings. Shared bonds and values that they can have with other people to build a sense of connection. Uh, reciprocity, uh, trust, and conflict resolution. And I'll just give you um, a quick example of reciprocity uh, with this young person who says um, they would do the same thing for me, talking about helping. Uh, like if I need them, they would come through. So why not me do the same thing for you? So that's the sense that like what community is all about is being helped and also helping others. That's a common um, sentiment in social capital theory that uh, there's a feelings of reciprocity as well as some of these other pieces, trust and shared bonds with others. So this aligns well with that theory as well. Um, and then an example of conflict resolution. I like this, um, this theme because it shows how community connections are contextualized. Within, um, within the particular community and the issues being faced. So because conflict is a common, is a norm in the community, young people identify you need conflict resolution skills as part of what a positive community looks like. Um, and this young person was asked, what does community connection look like? And she said, fun, happiness, and joy. And Um, sometimes when people have a bad argument, we still come back at the end of the day and shake hands. So this idea that you need this conflict resolution um, to build a positive community. There were also specific adult supports that young people talked about, uh, including uh, feeling heard, having two-way conversations uh, with adults, so not just um, not just adults caring about you, but adults also sharing things about themselves as well. Um, guidance and motivation from adults, uh, and this took various forms. Uh, and then feeling loved and accepted and believed in. So again, a lot of these are um, common things that we would see in the positive youth development literature, but were also contextualized for the young people based on what they were experiencing. Um, I'll just share this one example um, of feeling heard because it was the most powerful and salient theme and it, it comes into what we talked about last night um, at the community conversation. This youth was um, talking about an organization, a school club that he was involved in called Transforming Teens. And he was asked, well, what about going to this group made you feel like you can make a difference and he says because I get to speak I say what's on my mind I feel like I have a voice people don't usually listen to me but now when I have that group on Friday everybody starts listening we all have turns we have a leader for the day who gets to pick who wants to talk I know they'll listen to me because my counselor he really listens he listened to me all last year and we had talks at lunch with other kids. And then he went on to say that this experience helped, made him feel like he wanted to be more engaged with that group and find other places where he could also speak up. It also shows though that even young people who do feel empowered, uh, it's within certain contexts where they feel heard and they feel not heard in other contexts and they're equally as articulate about that. So I'll just skip through some of these so we can leave some time for questions. Um, but moving on to, uh, to talk a little bit about community level assets. And one of the main ones was having a safe space. Um, and for many of these kids, the recreation centers were their safe spaces. This is partly a 
a result of the way that we sampled because we were recruiting young people from rec centers so they had identified that as a safe space. But I think the, the way that young people talked about it showed that it was a really powerful and meaningful thing for them. This young person talks about the rec center as a safe haven. And we did a lot of these interviews in the summer. Um, she's saying that most of the kids are there from 9 in the morning to 9 at night. Um, they're spending all their time there. They're forming really close bonds with the staff and really forming these deep connections and relationships with them. Um, so um, this leads us to the tentative conclusion that really safe spaces are a prerequisite to forming some of these relationships, both the positive community connections and uh, the specific adult supports. There's probably some reciprocal associations going on that having adults who care make a space feel safe. Um, but um, but this is something that we're um, that we're finding. Just a, I'll try to be very short on um, thinking about what some of the barriers are. Uh, we identified a range of interpersonal barriers. Some of them are the opposite of the asset. So there's lack of support um, that comes in a range of contexts. This is a particularly um, poignant and um, distressing, I think, example from a young person who says, my family tells me that I'm dumb and that I can't do anything in life and I'm I'm going to be a nobody and stuff like that. So they're feeling a lack of support from a range of contexts, um, not feeling heard. Uh, um, this happened in many settings as well, um, but this example from teachers is was really powerful. I think we could write at least one manuscript about the use of views of teachers and all the different ways they're not supported in their schools. Um, but this young person said, my teacher ignored me. Um, he, he's ignoring me. Like, if I ask a question, he would just look away. Or if I say something, he thinks I'm lying. Um, so they really don't feel believed in or believed um, by some of the adults in their lives. Um, another main barrier is ageism, which I've talked to some of you about already. This idea that Adults really um, don't think young people are capable of community change or making a difference. We've seen this in the media um, recently with young young activists and, and people disparaging them. Um, this quote is, um, they say that's none of your business, stay in a child's place. So youth get excluded from a lot of the conversations in the community. Um, under the assumption that they really shouldn't be hearing about the violence and they shouldn't be um, part of doing something about it. And then the other barrier really has to do with um, the conflict, interpersonal conflict that occurs on a regular basis and, and some of the other aspects of, um, of community problems like drugs and games. Um, and that that makes young people pull away from the community to avoid some of those conflicts and avoid that trouble. Um, so really, violence was cited by almost every young person as a key problem in their community, and that aligns with the statistics that I showed you earlier. Um, that, And a lot of young people were afraid of getting shot walking through their neighborhood. I talked with one young person who actually was shot um, playing on a playground by a stray bullet in the neighborhood. So this is a very powerful, very salient daily experience that they have. Um, some of them talked about getting jumped by gang members and things like that. Um, so um, violence was related to a feeling of community disconnection. So trying to stay in only safe places, staying at home, um, not going outside on the streets, um, not making connections with people. And um, <coughs> one interesting thing that we're seeing with that is that disconnection really is an adaptive response for some of these young people 
in the community because they, they do want to avoid um, some of the, the violence and the problems as much as possible. Um, this is a good example of a quote that shows the adaptive nature of that, where the young person said, he was asked, how do you feel when you're disengaged from community? He said, when I'm unengaged, I feel more peaceful, it's less stressful, there's less to worry about. I don't have to hear any drama. Um, that happened. So, um, so really young people, some young people are intentionally disengaging as a way to cope with, um, with the problems in the community. So I'm going to try to bring it all together um, into this. This is really a working model that, like I said, we want to, um, we want to analyze a little bit further. Uh, but we do see for urban youth that it's essential for them to have safe spaces where they don't have to worry about violence, and it's in these spaces that they seem able to form some positive community connections and access supports from adults that help make them feel like um, their voice matters and that they can make different um, they can make different types of community change. <coughs> there are different forms of relational empowerment um, that lead to diverse types of, of civic action for them. Um, this pathway does look somewhat similar to the positive development model that I showed you at the beginning, but I hope that I've been able to make the case that it's also highly contextualized, that each piece is really uh, manifest in a certain way depending on the problems that they're facing and the resources that they have. Um, and then the second part that we're working through is that Really, violence, um, it's hard to know how to depict it because it is an overlay for the whole process and the, and the setting. Um, but that violence does lead to community disconnection. Um, and in some ways, that is adaptive, but nonetheless, it is related to disempowerment of young people. When they feel really disconnected, then um, they're a lot less likely to feel empowered to make a change. Um, so a couple of future directions, this is just for my own work, that we're going to continue testing this model, um, particularly with individual cases to see how these pathways, whether these pathways really fit individuals' experiences, so we still need to do that. Um, the second year of the grant uh, is involving uh, testing the model with, um, with Ad Health data, so Ad Health is a large longitudinal quantitative study, and there are a lot of different contextual neighborhood level and interpersonal variables. Um, so we're hopeful that we'll be able to make some connections between the qualitative and this quantitative approach. And then I would love to do a, a longitudinal mixed method study to understand civic empowerment more and how this develops for young people and some of the um, the ways that adults can support that. So um, just a couple of implications um, for theory. Um, I do think that that what we found aligns with existing theory on positive youth development, but that we need to really contextualize each of the pieces within whatever setting we're working in because it doesn't the same types of assets and barriers aren't there um, in all settings. Um, for practice, I think we're starting to identify some specific strategies that adults can use to support youth. Um, and this aligned well in the community conversation with how adults that we talk to seem to be working with youth. Um, for policy, um, I think safe spaces are essential. I think. Uh, particularly in the city of Rochester, knowing how valuable these rec centers are, I think is an important thing to communicate back to them um, and thinking about ways to strengthen and expand those resources. And then for the broader society, I think um, it is important to recognize some of the inequalities and the structural issues that um, make empowerment less possible for some urban youth, like the community violence. 
Um, but also I think that this work does start to challenge some of the stereotypes that young people are um, completely disengaged and shows that there's a lot of nuance. Even within the same person, there's some experiences of disempowerment and also some empowerment and engagement. So um, I'll stop there and just thank um, my research team members and also um, the Rochester Recreation Center staff and the young people whose voices I got the chance to share with you. So thank you. So I may not have left too much time for questions, but I, I really eager to hear any questions or feedback that you guys have. We're all watching so much for our lives. We have a few talks this past weekend, and in particular, um, one speaker, Edna Lisbeth Chavez, said, I carry that anxiety and trauma ever with me in regards to the way we to cope. She said, I carry it from school, in clubs, and in all of these situations. And so it started to make me think about trauma and how we have this trauma in our Perspectives is when we think of civic engagement um, to make sure that you are having the safe space to be intentional about really having those resources to help and to help the situation. Mm -hmm. um, so, how do you see trauma in particular, especially for you who are in these urban cities, in this country, violence, there are some people who do violence? How do we really inform this approach? I think that's a really good question. I think that that's, um, I guess I would say <coughs> that we should do more thinking about that, like how to, uh, you know, I'm thinking about engagement and, and solving some of the community problems, but I don't think you can completely forget about how much trauma there might be. Um, I think some of those adult supports and the community connections would play a role in helping you process what they're going through. They talked about doing that with peers and doing that with adult advocates. Um, and processing it is partly, um, I think, serves a dual role of making them feel like this, this isn't just happening to me, that th there's a structural problem here, that this is happening to all of us, that we can have this collective understanding of what we're experiencing and use that to to leverage some um, action. Yeah. I'm wondering if there is some, um, if there's any optimism at all around schools becoming safe places or is the sort of underlying idea that we need to find safe spaces for kids that are not schools because schools can't be safe spaces. You know what? I think that schools have great potential to be safe spaces and I think that that's one of the most disheartening set of things that, that we have in this study is just how the young people feel at school and the ways that teachers treat them. Um, one of the youth said, like, my teacher told me she would love to dance on my grave. And it's just like, how could a teacher possibly say that to a young person? But they're coming in to schools that have very few resources, that have um, a lot of conflict uh, between students that is a product of the neighborhood. Um, and they already have negative stereotypes of what the students are going to be like. Um, so, so there's a lot to overcome, at least in this urban context with the schools. In Rochester, um, in the state of New York, actually, the city of Rochester um, has is the lowest ranked school district. And then the school district right next door is the high, one of the highest in the state of New York. And they're right next to each other. So it, there's there's a lot of disparity in these urban centers. But I think their the potential is there, <laughs> but there's a lot of change that would need to happen. Um, I'm curious about your use of the term empowerment because I feel like that was something that was really popular maybe about 20 years ago, and 
then there were some critiques of it. People kind of backed off from using the word empowerment. So I'm curious about uh, why you think we should come back to it. Yeah, I think that's a good question. I When I started this study, it wasn't a framing that I had in mind. Um, but I think it just felt salient in the way that young people talked about, uh, I mean, they never used the word empowerment themselves, but in the ways that they talked about um, that there are different pathways to action. Like there's a personal agency piece there's a relational piece, and they have different views on where community change comes from um, that just, to me, fit well with um, current thinking on youth empowerment. Um, I do think for my own work and scholarship, I have some more thinking and work to do on that uh, because I wasn't, it sort of emerged as a theme, uh, but didn't really guide the study, um, but do you have any um, any reflections or feedback based on your thinking on empowerment? No, I mean, I'm just curious about the use of the term. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the model makes sense to me in a lot of ways. I think the focus on safe spaces is really interesting. I guess when I think about the term empowerment, especially like psychological empowerment, um, what I'm familiar with that is, is it's very much within the individual. Mm -hmm. And so your work is really highlighting the importance of context mm -hmm. and that you know person in context interaction, right? Mm -hmm. Not just the context towards the youth, but also youth agency to shape. I mean the whole idea of the engagement of the youth, right? Mm -hmm. So so yeah, I was just curious about you know, where that came in. Yeah. Yeah, and I do think there is like uh, I think that young people do have to feel like their actions are going to make some kind of difference, like there's some kind of hope and there's some kind of possibility for change um, to get them to to get them to action. Um, but I do think that that happens in context. And one thing I didn't talk about very much was what are some of the opportunity structures around. Um, engagement that are or aren't part of their part of their environments and we do have some data on that that we can flesh that out a little bit so I do think it context matters quite a bit for the process. So um, I think you got some really rich data by using qualitative methods which you probably would have never had access to had done that. So what is your after doing your first call to the project, what's your take on it? I mean, how would you summarize yes. your qualitative experience? Well, I have learned a lot. Um, and I do think, um, I think that the um, your methods should be guided by your questions. And in this case, I really wanted to hear what young people, how they were defining concepts and how they were thinking about and experiencing um, engagement. And so it just felt like the right method and I, I still think that that um, in future studies really the, the methods have to align with whatever the question is um, and I, I actually have so much more appreciation for qualitative the more that I involve get involved in it because I do think that there's a richness and a power to use voices being expressed and, and being the data um, so so there's some, something that quantitative would never be able to truly capture. Um, there is a complexity to it um, and a never-ending quality to it that is difficult for me as like a quantitatively minded person. Like when is the like when do we know we have our findings? We've been doing the coding and analysis for two years now. Um, and I feel like there's so much more there to know. So I just, I guess, as a new qualitative person, I'm like, when is it going to end? Or when can we write this up and feel like we have findings that are like there to share? So, so that I'm still figuring out. I'm curious, um, who conducted the interviews? 
were yes. you utilize people in the community there? Or how? That's how a good question. Um, I'm glad that you asked that. We had five interviewers. It was me. Um, I did about 30% um, of the interviews. Um, and then there were um, grad students mostly white women, um, although there was one black man who was from the community and he did a number of the interviews as well. Um, I think though that that is one of my takeaways, like my learning takeaways from the project that I would do that differently um, if I went back um, or, or the next time. I think that um, not necessarily the makeup I mean, I would like to have a more representative makeup from the community um, for the interviews, but I think even more so, like, interviewer training is something that I feel like we needed more of. And there's some, a couple of cringe-worthy moments <laughs> in the interviews where, like, a young person will be like, well, there's a lot of racism. Um, and then the interviewer might not pick up on that or like not really probe that so there may have been some need for more culturally sensitive training than I realized we tried to do some of that but um, but that was sort of I think one limitation it's great that young people were still able to share so much um, even though the, the interviewer quality you know it improved over time but it, but it could have been better yeah Um, uh, one of the things that I wonder about in my own work and um, similarly to what you're doing in addressing outcomes such as the engagement, I think really important to find individual assets for you. And I'm wondering how that fits in. Um, one thing that I struggle with is that I'm always I'm, I'm focusing on the individual and I'm always at work from trying to address um, systemic issues. So what can schools do differently? So I'm wondering how that fits, how your work would fit with moving the onus away from the individual onus um, yes. to other systemic um, processes. Yes. I think that the, um, I guess my perspective is that individuals develop from interactions with their context and individuals bring things to that and context bring both opportunities and constraints so that really to understand development you have to understand things about the individual and things about the context and how they work together um, so I think that that's what I think that that's what these findings somewhat show too is that um, I do think that there's a, a psychological empowerment piece that um, is important. It's part of youth's engagement is sort of how they think about change and that leads to action but that's grounded in what the adults, what kind of supports they have, what kind of community connections they're able to form, what kind of safe spaces they have access to. Um, how much and to what extent they experience the community violence. Um, so I do think that there are a lot of contextual issues. Um, the systemic ones, I think um, it was really from youth's perspective. So one interesting thing was that they didn't talk about systemic issues as much as I thought. They would, I think, because the violence is so prevalent and salient that it's hard, a little bit hard to think what causes that. Um, and some youth were thinking about that more than others when talking about poverty and education and, and how that plays a role in um, gang violence, but, but there wasn't as much of that from a youth. I think the better perspective is surprising to me necessarily because it seems so far away. Yeah. Right. Yeah, definitely. And we had a section of the interview where we talked about like what what do you think about what's your connection to the broader society? Like the country, like what does it mean to be an American, like different things like that. 
and that wasn't so salient for them. Like a lot of them don't think outside of their their streets that they live on um, because they have so much to deal with and think through there. So we have um, gone over. Okay. Um, um, so let's thank Dr. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. Thank you.